Rogers responded by going on a record unbeaten run. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of Miami Total Football Radio, a.k.a. Miami Total Football Radio. Man, every time I say it, it's just like, I don't know, I don't know how to explain it, it just gives me this feeling. I hope, hopefully for you listeners too, it gives you that, that this like special feeling. But anyway, my name is Franco Penizo, I am half of the co-hosting team of this podcast, the number one podcast on Inter Miami, and joining me as he normally does is El Primo, Steve Brenner. Steve, how are you doing today? I'm very well, uh, mate, all, all the better for the decent... Well, decent win on on uh, Sunday, but uh, you know, uh, not a great first half, but really dramatic second half. And um, the best bit though was at halftime when I went down to go and see my friend Sergio, who lives around the corner from me, and he's attending to the stadium for the first time. Bumped into two Miami Total Football Radio fans, Dave Stelnick, who I already knew anyway, but my main man Luis, who uh, was very complimentary, less complimentary about you. <laughs> Uh, he said that, yeah, I think he said he, he agreed with 75% of what I say. Um, I don't know what happened to the other 25%, but I'm sure that could be soothed over with a beer. But he did say that, I think he definitely said I pref- he preferred me. Uh, Luis tweet and let us know but also he said that you were overcritical, and I had to agree with that listen um if I'm overly critical of a team that's in last place then I will take that because well they're not in last place anymore but they had been in last place for much of the season um so yes if I'm overly critical then I, I will accept that as my role here and look we have different hats different sizes different for all different tastes so if you want the the Englishman with the English wit we, we've got you covered there if you want the the passioned Latino, you nasty got, we've Peruvian, got you there. <laughs> yeah, we got that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah we've, we've got we've got it for everybody, all different shapes, colors, and sizes here on Miami Total Football Radio. But, what I will say, for what, sorry, what I will say is that you know it was so nice just to see you know two guys who were really sort of pleased with what we're doing and you know complimentary and you know just say they sort of said thanks for you know putting out doing the output and keep up the good work. So thank you guys so much and thank you for everyone for listening and. Please keep giving. Um, would you would you do on iTunes stars or recommendations? Or <laughs> yes, yeah, stars and reviews. Stars and reviews. Oh, yeah. Which actually, I saw I saw a recent review that we got um, that was new the other day, and I was like, oh, it was really it was really uh, pleasant, a really pleasant review. It wasn't for my mother, was it? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, I don't remember the username. I'd have to go and check, but I don't think it was your mom. But yeah, speaking of that, if you haven't given us a review and you do listen to the podcast or you're listening to it now, please give us a review on Apple Podcasts formerly known as iTunes. It helps us out tremendously so that we can get further outreach in the South Florida and soccer football community. So please do that if you haven't already. Steve, we're going to touch on, in this week's pod, the 2-1 to victory over at Nashville SC. Inter Miami's now four-game unbeaten run. And we'll preview this weekend's match against New York City FC. We'll also return more to our regular Q&A session where we answer more than just a couple of questions like we did on the last one. So, got a lot to get to. So, Steve, let's get to it. Okay, Primo. So, Inter Miami is now unbeaten in four games after Sunday's 2-1 to victory over Nashville SC at Drive Pink Stadium in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Inter Miami came from behind to get the result in this one. This was the starting lineup for Inter Miami. You had Nick Marsman in goal. You had that five-man back line with Kelvin Leardam as the right wing back, Leandro Gonzalez Pires as the right center back, Nicolas Figal as the cent- central or middle center back, Christian McCune as the left center back, and Kieran Gibbs as the left back. Then in the midfield, you had Blaze Matuidi and Gregory. And then up top, you had the front three of Lewis Morgan, Gonzalo Higuain, and on the left, Rodolfo Pizarro. So that was Inter Miami's starting lineup in this one. They fall behind early in the second half. A great header from CJ Sopong off of a corner kick, but Inter Miami rallies. It gets a good finish from Gonzalo Higuain after a nice through ball from Blaze Matuidi. And then in the dying seconds, last gasp goal from substitute Indiana Vasilev off of a great cross from fellow substitute Federico Iguain. That's how Inter Miami wins the game. Steve, what was your biggest takeaway from Sunday's match? Um, well, the first half was instantly forgettable, wasn't it? It was, it was dire. Uh, we were looking around, just 
two teams cancel each other out. Remember, you know, Nashville came. <laughs> you just reminded me. I'm trying to remember what it was, but I, I remember telling you in the press box. I know you're bored because you're talking to me about what were we talking about? What did I was you... talking to you about. We were, for some reason, I was talking about Train Spotting, uh, which is a film, a legendary film oh. uh, about heroin addiction. <laughs> I don't know why we were talking about that. I don't remember either. I just remember I was like, you know, I know that you're that you are bored because you're talking to me about random things. I wasn't bored. It was, I wasn't bored. It was just not, there was nothing happening, was there? But I just thought it was <laughs> Sounds like yeah. you were bored to me. <laughs> if anyone hasn't seen Train Spotting by the way, you should see it. It's an iconic film. Oh no, I was I was saying because there's a Scottish lunatic in it and his name is Franco. But anyway, uh, that is there we go. that is it's, 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 it's this is not relevant at all other than if you haven't seen the film, watch it. This, um, these are the type of experiences me and Primo have in the press boxes. These, yeah, fa- these are fascinating exchanges. It was, it was. They, everyone was cancelling each other out. Um, you know, Nashville came here on the back of what nine, nine unbeaten, so they were in decent form. But nothing was really happening. But I thought second half was much, much better. Even, although they fell behind, I think the substitutions, which were we'll touch on, were instrumental in the win. Yeah. Uh, Federico Aguirre, Breck Shea, I thought was was really good, really energetic. That was a good move. Gibbs was a bit looked a bit little bit tired. And then, you know, just, yeah, great, great goal to, to win it. I thought in Indiana Vasilev, he thought he was good. Um, that's a different option. Never seen him play before. I thought he was lively, certainly lively on the pitch than maybe in his press conference when he's quite media trained. <laughs> he seems like a nice kid. Um, never easy, but I thought he played really, really well. And, um, yeah, it was just, yeah, a good, a good ending. And they just about, just, just about deserved it, I think. Yeah, so for me, the biggest takeaway was the performances of the DPs. And we'll touch on a lot of the elements that you just touched on here in just a little bit, including Indiana Vasilev. But I think we should start with the DPs because that's something that Phil Neville also discussed during his post-game press conference and said that this is the level they need to be at. Let's listen to his post-game quote, and we'll pick up from there. Well, I'd, I'd say, Frank Cole, that the three DP players played like three DP players. All three played like DP players. When you th- when your DP players play like that, we will win games of football. We will challenge for the playoffs. Blaze, I've got to say, I've not seen him play better than what I have in the last two or three weeks for Inter Miami. Gonzalo in the second half. What, what I think about Gonzalo in the second half is is that if he plays at that level, if he makes tackles, if he runs around, if he plays with that quality, the whole team, staff, supporters are inspired. And he's inspired. So that's his level. That's his level, and that's how good he is. He's world class. Blaze is world class. Pizarro's world class. We saw that in the Gold Cup. So when them three are playing at that level, we will be a better team. That's their challenge. That's what comes with being a DP player. The expectation, the pressure, and the and, and the need to deliver every single game. Steve, let's touch on each DP individually after hearing that, because I agree that all three of them did raise their levels. I think Iguain and Matuidi to a level above Pizarro, but in that first half that you mentioned was pretty tame, not a whole lot happening, pretty uneventful. I think Rodolfo Pizarro was the most creative attacker on the field for either team in that opening half. He created two pretty good chances or decent chances. The first one was was pretty solid to Kelvin Leardem, and Kelvin Leardem pulled the, pulled the shot wide with his left foot, but a good ball in behind there from Pizarro. Let's start with Gonzalo Higuain because I thought his performance after the goal, he looked like a completely different player. He looked like a completely different player, very engaged, like we would say in Spanish, enchufado, which means plugged in, but just engaged and involved and looking like a DP that wants to put the team on his shoulders and try to win the game for for the team. He was just running about, pressing uh, Nashville CS players, trying to win the ball back, making runs. It was just a different Gonzalo Higuain. Now, I don't know if that was just motivation from scoring the equalizer or just also if he's you know getting better physically, but he looked like a completely different player during during that last 30 minutes of the game. And also, just going back to the, the first goal, obviously it was a great ball, but just a great finish by Gonzalo Higuain, who I actually did think it looked a little bit trimmer. He looked a bit... He looked livelier, so um, you know maybe the maybe the training has has paid off. But you know sometimes when the ball goes into the box and the, the striker's onto it, unfortunately, someone like Robbie Robinson, he doesn't exude a lot of confidence, even though he can sc- he can score and he will score in the future for sure. Um, you know, score a lot of goals. But with Wigwain, as soon as he got the ball, you just knew he was going to score, and that's you know that's why you pay the, those sort of guys the big money because in you know again you know we we are a broken record. We're saying it all the time. If if those guys 
are performing, or at least two or three of them are performing really well, then the team have definitely got a chance. That's the way it, it kind of works in MLS, isn't it? You need those star guys. Yes, you, you have to have the solidity and, and, the, and the, you know, the, the team behind you. But in the end of the day, it's the big stars that invariably are going to pull you out of the fire. And I think, you know, for, for, for the first time in quite a while, they, they did just that. Yeah, we've touched on that quite a bit. We've said for a while now that one of the big reasons that Inter Miami had been struggling, not the only reason, but one of the big reasons was that DPs were not performing consistently. And this game maybe gave a glimmer of hope that they might be turning the corner. Now, it's one game. It's one game. So we'll see if they can sustain this, if they can continue to build on this, because that's what's going to be needed for Inter Miami to push for a playoff spot. Obviously, the other parts and other players have to do their, their jobs as well. But if you get your three DPs playing at a good level, especially players of their caliber and of their pedigree, um, then you're going to have a pretty good chance of winning games. Now, switching back to Matuidi, yeah, I think this was one of his best games in an Inter-Miami jersey. Maybe his best. Just because he got an assist, which, by the way, that through ball to Gonzalo Higuain at the hour mark was quality and a testament to Matuidi not giving up on the play because the ball, I think he initially tries to pass it forward to Pizarro and it, it ricochets off a Nashville defender and it falls back into his path. Um, but he makes the run forward to, to, to win that second ball or win that loose ball. And he plays it perfectly to Gonzalo Higuain in stride and Gonzalo Higuain with his quality just has to finish it from there. A little Juventus connection there, DP to DP. So I thought Matuidi was good and I thought it was not just because of the assist again. I thought he was just very concentrated very into the game because he, at the end the last well towards the end the 88th 89th minute maybe the 86th I'm trying to I'm blanking on exactly what what time it was but Inter Miami has a corner kick that comes back the other way and Nashville SC looks like it's about to to get, have a very good scoring opportunity and Matuidi makes a lung busting selfless run probably 60 plus yards to try to help put the fire out a cross eventually still comes in but uh, but the header goes wide of, of the frame. Inter Miami a little bit lucky there, but again, I thought Matuidi, by and large, had a great performance. He was named to the MLS Team of the Week, so he, he you know he avoided having the types of, types of lapses in concentration or the the lack of urgency and effort that we've seen from him in other games. This was a much more enchufado, like I said earlier, a much more plugged in, honed in, dialed in Blaze Matuidi, and, and, and it worked wonders for Inter Miami in the middle of the park. Yeah, abs- yeah, absolutely. No, I thought I thought man, Matuidi was was good. That was probably the best. I would say that was the best performance he's had since he came here, wasn't it? He was all over the place, linking up the midfield and attack, mopping up at the back as well. Um, yeah, I thought he was good, but not as good as, the, as Federico's cross for the. Oh winner. no, Federico's the cross for the game winner, um, which we'll get yeah. to. Which we'll get to in a second. Yeah, that was a, a, a lovely, a lovely dime of a pass. You touched on Robbie Robinson. He did not dress in this one. I was told he has a head injury and he's being treated day to day. Was not told if he's in the concussion protocol for MLS or anything of the like, but that he has a head injury and he's being treated day to day. Maybe we'll get more of an update on Thursday when we speak to Phil Neville during his pregame press conference. Going back to Pizarro, just to give, just to talk a little bit more about his performance. We've touched on Iguain, we've touched on Matuidi. Um, like I said before, I thought in the first half he had as much attacking ideas as anybody on the field, actually more so than anybody on the field. I think in the second half, he faded a little bit. Eventually, Phil Neville subs him out. But again, I think it's a step in the right direction for yep. him. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, he, he did show some nice touches. He was, he was busy. He moved, um, the ball, he moved the ball a lot faster yeah. than he normally did. There was one play where he held onto it a little bit too long. But besides that, I thought he moved the ball pretty, pretty well, pretty quickly, pretty accurately. Um, and that's what you need from him. And in addition to having the creativity and vision to try to, to find players in behind, and he, again, he hit Kelvin Leardam on that one opportunity in the first half with a nice ball ball in, in behind the defense. So a much better performance from Rodolfo Pizarro, I think. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, he did, he, he did fine. It's just, um, you know, they're not... It, it, it's, he's not going to go anywhere now, is he? I wouldn't have thought. So they, they've, I think they're going to... They're probably going to settle for... The, they're going to have to keep him for the season. So I think he showed enough there that, yeah... Slowly, slowly but surely, maybe he's coming, finding a little bit of form. You're right, though. He never looks happy. He never, looks, <laughs> he, he never he, smiles. Yeah, he's, I, I'm telling you, man. I think I think something has happened along the lines of of that. But that's just again, not information. That's just my sensation from from the out from the outside. Although I know you're not you're not too enamored with him still, because even in that first half, you were still kind of like, ah, oh, yeah, you were yeah, you I, weren't too happy. And, th- and then as soon as you as you were saying, as soon as you were being critical of him, he helped set up that that one pass to Kieran Gibbs. 
who takes yeah. the shot on goal, and then you're like, oh, all right, all right. <laughs> and I, literally, I literally just said, I don't rate him. Then he did the most astonishing piece of magic I've ever seen in my life, and that was it. I was, I was bold. I was, I was changed in that instant. Speaking of magic, uh, this is a quick little side note. Um, you know, I, I talked to my family over the weekend after the game, and they they said that you're no longer El Primo, that you're El Brujo now, which is like a witch or a wizard, because. I'm not sure if this is accurate, but they said that you got last week's prediction correct also. So that would make it two weeks in a row that you've gotten the prediction on the money. So I have to go back and, and double check that fact. But um, mm. yeah, they, they, they're calling you El Brujo now, not El Primo. But I like that. I like that. Can we <laughs> meld the two the names together? I mean, we could. We could. Prima Brujo <laughs> sounds, sounds good. Sounds like Portuguese manager. Yeah. So, something like that. Something like that. Um, let's, let's move on to Indiana Vasilev. He came off the bench and scores in the 95th minute. A fantastic header because he, he meets the ball perfectly. He's not the biggest guy, but he meets the ball perfectly, times his jump immaculately. And again, obviously, the f- a wonderful cross from Federico Higuain, who, who hits a ball in from a good spot. Um, on a play in which Inter-Miami was counterattacking, and Gonzalo Higuain looked like he was, uh, he was getting by his defenders on a very promising move. And then the referee gets in the way, and the ball inadvertently hits him. And Gonzalo Higuain is livid. Phil Neville was livid. He told us in, in the post game press conference because the the play had effectively been halted and had to be had to be stopped. The, you know, the referee had to blow the whistle to stop play, and, and Inter Miami picked up from there. Thankfully for Inter Miami, they were able to find Federico Higuain really quickly, and then he delivers that that wonderful sublime cross, and Inter Miami scores the winner thanks to Indiana Vasilev. So. Let's start there, actually. Before we go to Vasilev, you know, what did you just think of that sequence? Um, and obviously the admission afterwards by Phil Nutt was saying that he, he had lost it a little bit, or, um, or he had gone, excuse me, he had gone in the, in the moment before the goal. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, um, you know, I wrote my match report around that for the, for the Sun, um, Sun, Sun website, yeah, just about the fact that one minute Phil Neville was, we, I was watching him, he went absolutely mad when the, when the ball hit the ref. He was berating the fourth official, really, really going wild. And then literally, it, might, it was only like a minute later, wasn't it? I Not think. even, if, it was, it was if that, seconds, he was going mad, seconds. He scored, he was fist pumping. He's obviously, I think because Beckham is sitting at the front there, we can't see him from the press box now, but he's sitting at the front there. And yeah, so everyone, and everyone was going crazy and he was going crazy. And uh, yeah, he did lose it. But you know, that, you know, that's, it was, if you think back to that, you know, it was, it was very, very tight. They badly needed the win. You know, the atmosphere was good. To be fair, the whole, the whole way, the whole way through, didn't really. Just the singing and the noise was just constant. And uh, yeah, you know, that's what. So he was excused to be getting, getting a bit excited by that for sure. So now let's go to Vasilev because I've already described his goal, and you were really happy with his performance. Phil Neville also said after the game he thought he was. Uh, that Vasilev was the best player in the second half. What did you like about Vasilev? What did you like that you saw from him during his 35, almost 40-minute cameo that also comes with a decisive game-winning header? Uh, he was just positive, wasn't he? He was positive. When he picked the ball up, it looked like something was going to happen. He was going past people with, with speed. Uh, he was moving forward. You know, you, you, with, I guess, Matuidi and Gregore and Uloa, you know, you don't really get that because they're more holding midfielders. They're just, you know, they're waiting for the attacking players to try and make space and make something happen. But he was making something happen. You know, he is, I guess he's, a, yeah, he's more of like an attacking midfielder, really. But that was the first time I'd seen him. And yeah, and then of course, then gets in the right spot, a great cross, but also a great run for the header. He's got to be in the box. Um, no, he, I think he, he looked good. And I think initially when he came, it must have been a, a Chris Henderson signing. I, I'm not, Phil never wasn't, I think, sure, to be honest about him. He wasn't sure. Uh, but I think he's definitely sure now that he's a, he's a, good, he's a good player. Oh, I wasn't as enamored as, as you were, with, you know, initially when I went back and watched the game. Sensation was still kind of more or less the same. I do think he brought. Uh, more of an attacking element to the team in terms of trying to make things happen on the dribble, trying to penetrate Nashville SC's uh, defensive third into Miami's final third. I think he helped them in that regard. Um, you know, he was definitely making runs into the box, crashing the box, looking to combine. He definitely injects some speed into the team, right? Some of the young, fresh legs that, again, Inter Miami doesn't have by and large. They don't have a lot of speed on the team. So I think it's also notable um, that he brings that as well. I don't, again, I don't think he was incredible, but with the decisive goal in his overall performance, I think it's a very positive step in the right direction for a player who is still trying to find his way within the team, still learning his teammates, surely still learning the tactics. I do think Phil Neville had a big part, again, in pushing the right buttons and finding this result because the game-winning goal comes from two substitutes. 
Federico Iguain to Indiana Vasilev. And I think at this point, Indiana Vasilev, like Phil Neville said after the game, might be might start pushing for more minutes and potentially even some starts if he can keep this up. Now, Steve, quickly let's touch on Phil Neville because we touched on the substitutes a little bit ago. But I think he's starting to find his footing with this team. I think he's starting to figure things out with this team. What are its strengths? What are its weaknesses? He has changed the formation into this, you know, you could call it three at the back, but it's really a five at the back. It's a it's a five two three. This formation that he used in the middle of the game against CF Montreal when he switched into it the, that two to one victory. Since then, he has stuck with it, and it's it's worked. It's given the team more solidity defensively, so they're not giving up as many chances and as many goals. And it's also helped them gain some control and improve the performances of a lot of players. So the team in general is functioning better now, and I think that's a byproduct of Phil Neville figuring things out a bit more after especially after that 5-0 loss because since then it's been again a, a franchise record for a game unbeaten run but yeah and, and that's why I will always champion giving the mat giving a manager a, you know a season give him a, give him a chance to implement these ideas you think six how many games really has he played for, for 16 now in the league maybe th- what was it two or three preseason so you know you don't <laughs> you, I guess it, it takes time doesn't it to, to work out exactly what the, potentially the best system will be I'm currently into Miami manager on Football Manager 21. You know, I'm taking my time. It's difficult. It's difficult. But I just think, you know, you just need time. And I, I'm, like I said, you went back to last season. I always said, give Diego Alonso at least a season just to just to see it. And I think you've got to be judged after the end of not one season, not now. But yeah, um, he seems to have settled on, on that on that formation. Look, it's, he's, he's turned it around. But it's, uh, like you said, baby steps. And, you know, it's still going to be a real... I think it would be an achievement from this position right now if they got into if they got into the playoffs. I think that would be a a good achievement. It's not to say they shouldn't it shouldn't be a problem for them. It, and it, obviously it has become because of the bad form. But um, you know, I think um, they've 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 shown that they've got a chance. And if they can keep the, the, the big players fit, then um, you know they should be up there. They are right now in twelfth place. They moved out of the basement, out of the hole that they were in in the Eastern Conference. They are now in twelfth place, still a few points away from the playoffs. They do have a couple of games in hand, but let's not also get carried away. This is just four games, and it's only been two wins in those four games. So let's let's see them continue this. This is definitely progress, 100%. I agree with that, but this isn't it. This is not. This is just only the beginning, right? These are baby steps, as he has said, and as you just mentioned. Eight point eight points behind Columbus in uh, in seventh, but I mean, uh, there are a lot of there are a lot of games to go. No, there's right. definitely there's definitely a lot of time, right? There's definitely a lot of time. But we're almost at the halfway point of the season. This weekend will mark Inter Miami's seventeenth game that, that marks the halfway point and clearly they're not where they where they expected to be. But regardless, they're they're starting to give fans and give us on the outside some reason to believe that maybe they can turn this thing around. But again, still games to be played, still games to be won, still points to to have to grab. Steve, let's take a quick break and we'll come back after that to preview the matchup against New York City FC this weekend. Let's give us control in games. Uh, but I've got to say, watching New York City last night, you know, we've got to be adaptable with our system. When teams play lots in midfield, we've got to we've got to make sure that we match them up in midfield. So it's a system now that we know we're four two three one, three four three, three five two. We know we've got two or three systems that the players are comfortable with. And and we've been working really hard with these systems for the last three, four, five months. Now we're beginning to see it flow. Okay, Primo, switching gears. Inter Miami this weekend plays New York City FC. Another tough test for Inter Miami because New York City FC is in third place in the Eastern Conference right now. It's coming off of a pair of maybe disappointing draws. Yeah, disappointing draws given the opposition. But before that, they had beaten the Columbus crew 4-1 to and smashed Orlando City 5-0. to So... They're on a five-game unbeaten run right now. They play Wednesday night in the contrived League's Cup. I'm not a fan of the League's Cup at all. If you follow me on Twitter, you probably know that by now. But what do you expect from New York City FC on the weekend? Given that they're playing a midweek match, don't know how their head coach, Ronnie Delia, is going to approach that. Is he going to go with the starters? Is he going to go with the reserves like Peter Vermees of Sporting Kansas City did on Tuesday night, we'll see. But what do you expect from New York City FC on the weekend? 
Yeah, I mean, it's um, you know they're on a they're on a decent run and they've had some some decent uh, home wins. You know, five 0 over Orlando, four four one over Columbus. Um, so they've definitely got a, a goal in them. Uh, but I just think you know Inter Miami will go there with with confidence. You know, they know that they've shown that they can sort of defend as a team and, and hold things together when they got the draw in Orlando and uh, you know, so and they they're, they're starting to score or definitely create more chances. So um, you know, yeah, I think they go there in, in decent shape. So, and this is an away game. Again, this this game was actually originally scheduled for 3 p.m. It's now going to be played at 8 p.m. And it's not going to be at Yankee Stadium, which for Inter-Miami fans, that's probably a good piece of news because Yankee Stadium for a football aspect, from a soccer aspect, is not a great place to watch games. Just the dimensions obviously are not made for soccer. So... The experience on TV as well as in person is not the most pleasant. I know you've been there. You and you and I had both covered games there. I don't know what your thoughts are on it, but it's definitely not not the not the best seating arrangement for a press box, and definitely not for the fans. No, no, it's not. And you know, they, when you talk about Miami's, um, you know, stadium trouble. You know, New York has been around. Uh, NYCFC have been around longer than that, six, seven years now, I think, and they're no closer. I don't think to, to getting their own. Their own stadium, um, you know, where do you build a stadium in the middle of Manhattan? It's, it's difficult. There, um, there was a little lot next to the Yan- Yankee Stadium, which I thought they were going to do at some point, but um, yeah, I mean, they haven't really moved much. It doesn't see it. They're certainly not building anything uh, right now. Put it that way. So, uh, Inter Miami yeah, could it, have two soccer-specific stadiums. Could before New York City FC. No, has yeah, one. it could, it yeah. could. But I yeah. mean, Inter Miami is not also is also not making much progress on its Miami pursuit for uh, for a plot of land. So. Um, Look, this game is at Red Bull Arena. It's in New Jersey. At some point, you're going to see an Inter-Miami New York City FC game at Yankee Stadium. And if you've never seen a game there before, either on TV or in person, remember this podcast. Remember this this conversation because you will most likely be uh, dreading dreading that viewing experience. Um, look, for me, Inter-Miami, it's going to be a tough test. I think New York City FC will field a strong lineup. Not sure what, how they're going to approach their, their Wednesday game, but... I, you know, even if it's a mixed lineup, I still would expect New York City FC to, to field a very strong team at what's being a, considered a home game for them against an Inter Miami team that's on uh, on a roll as of right now. So, for Inter Miami, Phil Neville said something during his post game press conference that I think kind of maybe tipped his hand a little bit, and I don't know if he was just caught up in, in the emotion of the game and or if he if he wanted to do it on purpose, but. He tipped his hand a little bit because he talked about how he watched New York City FC's game from the weekend, and he mentioned that they have numbers in the middle of the park, and that because of that, it sounded like, and this is just me reading into what he said, sounds like he is considering maybe changing up the formation, moving away from this this 5-2-3 formation and into something else this week just to help give Inter Miami more numbers in the middle of the park to counteract what New York City FC does. So don't be surprised if we don't see that 5-2-3 this weekend. Steve, for you, for Inter Miami, what is the key to the game? What does Inter Miami have to do to at least get a result, if not a win? Yeah, create create chances. I think just try and be on the on the front foot as much as possible. I think if you defend, try and defend for 90 minutes, it you know it can kill you in the end. But they've started to um, yeah create more chances. I guess but look more of a threat offensively. Um, just need to be when those chances do come, take them. And they did, you know, they did do that on, eventually on Sunday. But there were a few other opportunities which you know they they could have taken. So um, yeah, that's thing. That's the key for me, Steve. The key to the game is what Phil kind of alluded to this past weekend, and that's winning the possession battle, winning the middle of the park, the center of the field, because New York City FC has some talented players in there. They have Alfredo Morales. Peruvian, German, American, who has represented the U.S. men's national team in the past, who arrived from Germany this offseason. They have James Sands, who just played with the U.S. men's national team at the Gold Cup and helped them win that. They have Maximiliano Morales. They have Ismael Tajudishai. They've got some talented, talented players in that middle of the field that can not only boss possession, but can also create and cause you damage in the final third. So I think... Defending with the ball as much as without the ball will be important for Inter Miami. So I think winning possession, being able to dictate the tempo at times and control the match at times, I think that will be important. It won't be easy. It won't be easy because because New York City FC this this group of players by and large has has been together for a good bit. A lot of the pieces have been in place, so they know what they play and they've been very good at that. So for me, it's, it's the 
it's the middle of the park that that Inter Miami has to really try to try to win in order to give itself a chance at getting a result at Red Bull Arena on Saturday. Steve, what lineup changes do you think we could see? Do you think there's anything that that Phil Neville does differently? Again, I think there will be a formation change. You know, maybe he goes back to the four two three one just to have more bodies in the center of the park to to counteract what New York City FC does. That's just what I think. But what do you think? Do you think we'll see a formation change? Or do you think we'll see personnel changes? Um, yeah, he may freshen up. Maybe, I mean, maybe Vassal level will, will, will start. Maybe Pizarro will drop out. Um, you know, Shawcross didn't start, did he, on Sunday? Um, he, he could come back in, but I thought they were pretty good defensively. So I don't think there'd be too many too many changes, really. But I think, you know, Vassal level will push him for a start, won't he? Maybe. I mean, you know, again, I think he's still working his way to his best in terms of his sharpness. And, and in terms of his fitness, he, he said that after the game, he's still working to get uh, back to, to his best in this heat and humidity uh, in terms of his conditioning. So it depends where he stands there. It helps to remind me that they have a proper week's worth of training. They've had a good amount of time to recover from the game and uh, from the weekend's game, and they'll have enough time to prepare for New York City FC. So that helps into Miami. What changes could we see? You know, if Robbie Robinson's healthy, he probably comes back in. But now, now it gets tricky because now there's different players performing. Do you go Pizarro or Federico Higuain? Do you go, do you go Indiana Vasilev or Robbie Robinson or Lewis Morgan? These these are now decisions that Phil Neville is going to have to make. Um, you know, so what, that's what his job, man. That's his job. That's what he has to do. Sure. So I, I would say I'm going to predict a four-two-three-one. Nick Marsman in goal. I think he goes with Kelvin Leardam at right back. Nicolas Figal at right center back, Leandro Gonzalez Pires as left center back, and Kieran Gibbs as the left back. Matuidi and Gregory in the middle. Your second midfield line will be Lewis Morgan, Pizarro, and Indiana Vasilev. Yeah, I think Indiana Vasilev gets the start if Robbie Robinson is not cleared to play, if he's still dealing with this head injury that we've been told about. And Gonzalo Higuain obviously starts up top. So I think, yeah, I think you'll see a four two three one, and I think you'll see Indiana Vasilev maybe go into the starting lineup, maybe on the right, and Lewis Morgan goes out on the left, or Indiana could start off on the left and and Lewis Morgan on the right. But something along the lines. That's my that's my prediction for, for the weekend's game. Steve, what is your prediction for Saturday? Does Inter Miami keep it rolling? Do they keep it going with uh with another point or three, or will they end up with zero? My, my my legend is on the line now, isn't it? With your family. <laughs> el brujo, el brujo. Let's see, if, let's see if you can keep it up, man. If I don't get it right, that it's just shattered. That illusion has just been shattered into yeah, a million just, pieces. You'll just return so. to the basic old primo again. <laughs> oh. Um, I'm going to go 2-0. Two 2-2. All. Two, two. Two, two draw. Yeah. Okay. So Feel Inter it, Miami, my bone. Inter Miami keeps rolling in terms of staying unbeaten with a tie. This is a tough one, man. This is a tough one because New York City FC plays uh, midweek... So they'll be on short rest, but they're at home. Inter Miami has to travel. Mm, New York City's pretty good. I'm going to say a one to zero loss. One zero loss for 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 Inter Miami. They're they're on a they're on a roll. They become a much more tactical team under Phil Neville. You know, making sure that they stay solid at the back and and focus on the defensive side, not taking that many risks in the attack, but. I think against New York City FC, with the talent that they have and the chemistry that they have, even on short rest, I think that they'll find a way to break through Inter Miami's defense, and Inter Miami doesn't score in this one. But we'll see. We'll see how they do. Inter Miami has done fairly well so far against teams that are high up in the Eastern Conference standings. They've competed well. They've given themselves chances to win. And they've been able to win a couple of these. So they've gotten results against good teams. It would not be out of the realm of possibility for them to get a result here against New York City FC. So we'll see what happens on Saturday. We'll leave that there. We'll take another quick break and we'll do our Q&A session after this. It's Q&A time. 
And we're going back to our regular Q&A type session where we answer several of the questions we've got or most of the questions we've got. The first one, we have to start with this one. It's the first one that came in and it's quality. Que rica pregunta, as I said on Twitter. And it's from Don Cafecito. And he says, with my belly full of papayong, not Papa John, papayong, it's written in a, in a Spanish way, I now wonder, where can I find the inspiring picture of Mount Everest that Neville showed his team after the New England match? Even the DPs are performing better. Is that really all it took? Laughing emoji, laughing emoji with, with the teardrops. For those that might not know what, what Don Cavacito is referencing, Phil Neville in the post-game press conference this weekend said that after the 5-0 defeat to the New England Revolution, you know, the team had, had practically hit rock bottom. And that he and the staff showed the players a picture of Mount Everest, a mountain, to say that they had to climb this mountain together. And that's the only way that they were going to be able to turn this thing around and be anywhere close to what they want to be. So that's what Don Cafecito is referring to. Now, now we can answer the question. Steve, <laughs> is this really all it took? And where can he find this inspiring picture of Mount Everest? I mean, you could, I'm sure you can find pictures of Mount Everest everywhere. You know, like but this of... exact picture. We need this no, picture, this inspiring that. picture that, that has Gonzalo Higuain running uh, off the ball, that has Rodolfo Pizarro more creative, that has Blaise Matuidi more focused and concentrated. Where can we find that picture? You're it's El Brujo, somewhere. man. You're El Brujo. Yeah, maybe maybe you have to scale Mount Everest to see it. I'm not sure. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, whatever it did whatever it did it worked maybe it be a different mountain next week we don't know <laughs> look I, I, again I'll go back to what I said towards the end of the last segment and something that I don't think uh, I touched on as much as I would like to but I think what happened after that game not only did the team really dig deep but I think Phil Neville solidified the team defensively by changing the formation and coming to terms with look the team is talented it has talented players in the attack but it doesn't really function well that well in the final third it's, and he has made the team more defensive minded remember initially he wanted a possession based team that high pressed we've seen some high pressing we've seen better possession but it's all come as a result of trying to be more defensively solid and that that is why we've seen him throw numbers back um, the performances aren't master classes in football it's not like you're seeing uh, a lot of great quality soccer and especially in the final third but it's, it's improved inter Miami. It's improved the team. It's improved the functioning of the team. It's helped players raise their levels by playing more to their strengths. So that's why I think you're seeing him stick with this formation by and large with, with five defenders because it just closes those spaces in behind and makes inter Miami uh, stronger defensively, which then in turn allows them to, to stay in games and then show their other qualities in, in the midfield and in the attack. So... I think that's what's really, really helped more so than than the picture of, of Mount Everest. Next question comes from Daniel Mejia. Mathematically, we're still in it, but given our dreadful overall record, any chance we actually make the playoffs? Primo, you can start there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, why not? Um, as you say, still what? Seven, how many games to go now? So there's, uh, there'll be, there's 18, 18 to go. 18 games. It's a lot of points. They're only eight points off, I think, now, like we said. Um the playoff zone, yeah. Why not? Just have to keep winning. Can they? Can they? Yes. Can they actually make the playoffs? Yes. Obviously, they're they're within reach, and there's a lot of the season left. Um, you know, Matt. He says mathematically, and, and in Spanish, they always say "saca la calculadora," like bring out the calculator and start doing the math for how many points you need um, to get there, and, and which games you can win. There's enough games where Inter Miami, if they keep up the level that they've been showing, they absolutely. They absolutely can make the playoffs. Absolutely. Will they? We'll see. We'll see. Again, this has been a good run, an improved run. It's a record run for, for the franchise history in terms of not losing a game. But even in that, they've only won twice. And if you look at the the bigger picture, they've only won twice in the last, what, 10 games. So they have to keep this level up and not revert back to the other level, which is a challenge. We'll see how, how they do in that regard, especially when teams now start to adjust to the adjustments they've made, if that makes sense. Next question comes from Fighting Herons, and this one's directed, well, I guess it's directed at us, but it's you know more directed at you, Steve. Can mm. El Primo let us know the score for this Saturday's game at the beginning of the episode? I need to call my bookie. <laughs> Only if you give me 5%. <laughs> Only if you give him 5%. Well, wow, it's, it's very generous of you, Steve. Very generous. Um, yeah, Steve, look, see, you've been hitting the nail on the head, so... You're, uh, you're doing your thing, man. You're doing your thing. 
Next question comes from Pablo Coppola. Are we starting to see Neville figure out the league with his substitution patterns and tactical adjustments? Steve, I'll let you start there because I just touched on this a little bit in terms of the, the adjustments he's made with the team. Maybe not so much with the substitutions, which I'll, I'll, I'll touch on in a second, but I'll let, I'll let you begin there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess, you know, he's, he's, he's like we said earlier, he's, he's just trying to find working with the players and trying to find the right systems and who, who, who fits there. And, you know, remember, this is his first, I mean, obviously he was manager of the women's, England women's national team, but this is his first club management role as in him being, you know, the, the, the head coach in Valencia. He was assistant to his brother and then to Nuno Espirito Santo, you know, the new Spurs manager who was at Wolves. Um, so, you know, he, he's a, he's a newish coach, I guess, in terms of just running, you know, a team like this. So, uh, you know, I, on, I keep saying, just give him a season seat and see where, see where the team are at then. But um, yeah, I think he's starting to find his feet for sure. Yeah. I, th- I think he's, like I said, multiple times on this pod, I think he's figuring the team out and players out and what they can and can't give them. It's, you know, every coach has his own philosophy and it's ideal, you know, an ideal scenario, you'd be able to play that. But, but, you have to work with what you've got in front of you. I think that's one thing that Diego Alonso did not do a good job of last year was was make adjustments to the team he had with him. I think Phil Neville has realized what the strengths are of certain players and the overall team, and he's now made adjustments that maybe aren't what he wants to play, not the type of soccer he envisioned or the type of football he envisioned when he arrived, but it's what's getting them results now. So I think he's, he's making those adjustments. His substitutions have also proven a lot more effective. He's going to his bench quicker he's making players are making an impact that are coming off the bench we saw that this weekend with indiana vasilev and federico Igoain, both substitutes combining for the goal so he's he's gaining more confidence with the team and as a result the team is also gaining more confidence and players are gaining more confidence because now they're they're winning games so i think it's a it's a it's an overall it's an all thing it's not just one thing it's just overall he's he's figuring things out with with the group of players that he has right now Next question comes from Gabe P. I don't see a way out for Carranza. If we can't sell him nor we play him, what would you do with him? Should we keep McCoon on the left center back position and grow him to become a starter next year? Or should we play players that we would need to sell next year? How many players will we keep from our best 11 at the end of the year? We will probably need to get rid of one DP and four TAM, target allocation money players. Maybe sub those for a young DP and two under 2020 initiative players. Do you see that happening? So there's a lot there. There's a lot to unpack. Um, I will touch on the McCoon part. I will touch on the McCoon part because I think Christian McCoon in this game, he was pretty good. And he's been pretty good over these last few games as one of the three center backs. He's looking a lot more comfortable with the ball at his feet. Because before, dating back to last year, I, I, I saw a player that didn't like the ball at his feet. I saw a player that would smash the ball, even even throughout early parts of this year, would smash the ball into the stands or kick the ball high up the field whenever he got to it. He just didn't look like a player that felt good on the ball. But credit to Phil Neville and the staff and credit to Christian McCoon for the execution. They've given him the confidence to say, hey, look, we know you can play with the ball at your feet more. Do it. Take you know take chances while being smart. And he's, he's doing a good job of that. Something I asked him... Uh, post game because he did speak to us post game Christian McCoon did and it's something that he briefly briefly mentioned so um, you know I, th- I think he's going to continue to get looks I think he's going to continue to get looks maybe not this weekend because Inter Miami might move out of that formation but I expect him to to continue to get looks now and in the and in the longer term future if he can keep up this level because again he's he's young and he's showing very interesting improvements Steve so that we don't harp on any one question of these many questions here from Gabe P, I'll let you choose which one you want there. Although I think the Carranza one is one that you, you'd probably be interested in. If, if he says, Gabe P says, if we can't sell him nor we play him, what should you do with him? So what do you think Inter Miami should do with Carranza? I don't think, I mean, there's nothing they can, I mean, they could try and get him to maybe play better. Um, just, yeah, it just hasn't, it just hasn't happened for him, has it really at all? Um, but, I mean, the, the window's closed now, so there's not really going to be what, any movement at all, is there? Well, I mean, they could sell him if somebody buys him from a, a, a market that has their window still open. But yeah, no one's yeah. buying him. No one's buying him this this summer. No one's buying no, him this summer. They're it'll, not gonna, it'll have they, to be in the winter. And they're not going to be able to get anyone else in, are they? That's the problem. So it's no, kind well, of... not, Yeah, they definitely can't get anybody in. The, the, the window's no, closed. So... Um, but they yeah, they but... could sell him in the winter. I think that's what they, they would probably have to do. Yeah. So, sell him back to an Argentina team. Cut your losses. You're paying him close to 900000 
Uh, so they, obviously, that's not you're not getting a good return on that. So like Pellegrini, maybe find him a solution where you know he probably wants more minutes than he's getting. So I'm sure that it could be resolved in some way, shape, or form. Although he again, he is on a pretty good bit of coin. So that's something that has to be considered. Um, next question comes from Elder Bar, who changed his profile picture. It's now a picture of of an Inter Miami game, one of the first games, actually from the very first game from uh, the Inter Miami LAFC game in 2020. And he says, did we do things right this time with the signings of Gibbs, Marsman, Indiana, and Gregory? Not saying they are amazing, but their resumes say they should cost a good amount. Or will we have another issue like we did recently with salaries and signings? Steve, do you want to start there? No, they've, they've been four good signings. He also picked out Nick Marsman again, didn't he? That was the other night he said, um, you know, the, the goalkeeper's really, really helped us just with his, I think his presence, his distribution is good, isn't it? Um, yeah, he, he made that point the other night that, you know, he's been pleased with him. He's been pleased with Kieran Gibbs. Grigore has been, you know, has, has been great. And we've also talked about Vasilev. So, yeah, I think, and then there's Leardam also that came in, wasn't it? Jovan Jones. So there has been play, there has been, you know, obviously movement with, with players. Um, it's just the, the, the bigger assets, they can't seem to, you know, get the, get the best of. But the guys they brought in, I, I think they've all done well, yeah. I think the question was more along the lines of, did they do the right thing when well, signing these when we're signing these players did they make any issue did they have any issues obviously we don't know but i will no, I mean, listen i would put i would put listen, my, like i would put my neck looking... on the line i would put my neck on the line to say chris henderson is not going to do what paul McDonough did and and sign players in in ways that are illegal for mls roster rules and regulations i'm pretty confident in saying that i think chris henderson plays by by the rules and and does things by the book um, I would venture to, to put my neck out on the line to say that. So, especially, especially after this happened last time. So, I don't think there's any worry, any worry there if that if that's more along the lines what the question was about. Um, no, listen, Inter Miami probably being watched like a whore considering what you know what happened with Matuidi. So they wouldn't take any risks, and and you know it's a different regime now, different front office. It's you know those people have, or the certainly the the, the perpetrators before have, have have gone. So um, I didn't even think about that until you mentioned it to be fair yeah but no. I could, you know. they have to be, they're gonna be it's like you know when you're a, a kid in school and you're you just got in trouble you're gonna be on your best behavior so you don't Absolutely. get in trouble again last question comes from endo any logical reason why people think pipa won't get 20 plus goals this season our wingers need to score some goals what areas do we need to improve on the attack to get better clear-cut chances for robinson or morgan per se i mean yeah. Uh, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot. There's a lot. You know, they, they would have to take more chances. They would have to have uh, more of a true playmaker on the field. They would have to make runs in behind. But again, these are not only personnel questions. These are tactical questions as well. And right now with how Inter-Miami is playing and how Inter-Miami is focusing on being defensive-minded first, being solid defensively, I don't think you're going to see a whole lot of chances. I agree that other players need to score goals, although we're starting to see, you know, Indiana Vasilev score this week. We saw Robbie Robinson score not too long ago, so other players are starting to contribute, but yes, there needs to still be a, a raise in production overall. However, when you have tactics that are more reactive, it's going to be tough to to create a whole lot. So I don't know how much how much better Inter Miami can get with how they're playing in terms of the attack, but I agree that, that there is some room for improvement. And if, hey, look, if Pizarro can 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 do more of what he did in the first half on a more consistent basis, then I also think that helps open the door for other players to score. Because like I said, we saw Kelvin Leardam have a good opportunity off a good little for Pizarro pass in the first half, and then we saw Kieran Gibbs also have a, a shot on goal off of a more of a simple pass from Pizarro, but it helped generate that that, that scoring opportunity. This could be it. This could be Pizarro's time. You know, he could all of a sudden find his form and lead them, lead them into the playoffs. Um, yeah, I mean, you just you, you never you never know. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? That'd you don't nice you don't even believe that. that. You don't even believe what yeah, you're well, saying. It could happen. <laughs> it could happen. It's, up to, yeah, it's up to him if he wants. To, but look, he's not. He's not a true number ten. He's not a true number ten. So like, well, look, I I think we can see more of that. I think we can see more of what we saw. Like I said just now, we can see more of that type of play for him. But I don't think over the course of ninety minutes he's going to do that over and over and over again because he's just not that type of player. He's more of a player that likes to, to move the ball, distribute the ball, not necessarily someone that has the vision or that breaks the, the defensive line with through balls and things of the like. Can he do it? 
On occasion, sure. Can he do it more than he's been doing it? Absolutely. But is he going to do that on a regular basis and give you that threat consistently? I personally don't think so. I just don't think he has that in his repertoire to do that consistently. Well, we will see if he can do it or not. But he's not that type of player. So, like, you know, like... Yeah, but I, no, I but he can still influence a game, though, man. He can still, even, he can even still take better than he is and influence sure, a game. And, sure, and, but, you know, drag the team with him. He's, 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 he's supposed to be that caliber of player. Sure, but it'd be like asking, you know, and this is being extreme here, but it'd be like saying to Gonzalo Higuain, be as fast as Robbie Robinson. You know, like, oh, if, that, I mean, if, that's not, if that's not the type of player you are, it's just not the type of player you are. Um, again, he can no, get better. No, it's just well, play well on a consistent basis. And he hasn't, he hasn't done that. But well, he can do now. But the question is, how do they get better in the attack? I think him... He's he's he a possible. Help. Sure, he, he definitely help. helps. He definitely helps. Big time. Even look, but even look, Federico Higuain. We're, we're we're going off track here, but even Federico Higuain, um, he created a goal this weekend from a, across from deep. But but he has not been creating a whole lot for Inter Miami, even in his recent performances. He hasn't been like the the number tens just aren't creating much. I think again, that's part of it's tactical. I don't think. Phil Neville wants the players to be running into space as much as he wants them to check for the ball and play to feet. So I think part of it is tactical as well. So, but yes, Pizarro. If he, Pizarro plays better, then that should help generate more chances. Steve, that does it for the Q and A session. Let's wrap up with your final thoughts. I'll give mine, and we'll call it the show after that. No, um, I thought just yeah, I thought the second half was was enjoyable the other day. I don't think they haven't it hasn't been that enjoyable recently. I thought it was just exciting, and yeah, I just love meeting all the our, our fans or our, our listeners. Sorry, and it was so cool to see people and know that you know they appreciate what we're doing, man. I thought that was so cool. Well, we definitely should try to meet up with some of them before a game. I know your schedule is super hectic and tight, but one of these home games we should sure. try to. We should try to meet with some of them before. I have done it before where I've gone to some of the pregame tailgates and, and had some some banter and some talks, some soccer talks with some of the listeners, which has been fun. It's good to put faces to names and get to know you guys on a more personal level as well. So let's try to let's try to coordinate that, Steve. Let, let's try to do that. Um, if not before the end of August, at least by September. Let's try to make that yeah. let's try to make that happen. My final thought is that I'm going to give a big thank you to Michelle Kaufman of the Miami Herald because I will be freelancing for them this weekend. It'll be my first byline in the Miami Herald. I'm just doing it as a, as on a temporary thing, just a one-time thing to, to fill in for her because she is on vacation. But I appreciate so much the gesture, especially right now that I'm a little bit in, in limbo with regards to what my writing future is. So thank you, Michelle, and thank you for the Miami Herald for the opportunity this weekend. I'm really looking forward to it. Big local paper that, uh, you know, from a personal standpoint, uh, it will be a nice little little milestone, a nice little feather in the cap. So hopefully Inter Miami gives me and, and all of us something to talk about and something to, to definitely write about. It's now going to be a dreadful nil-nil draw. <laughs> and we're going to be struggling to write 900 words. And you'll be thinking, why? Why did I turn fake? No, yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll listen, see. listen, no, see, you just did your... You just did your hedging your bets thing where you say one score and now you said another one. So now if you, now if it comes out to be 0-0, zero, zero, you're going to be like, oh, look, I said it at the end of the pod. You see? You see how no, you do that? No, this I is part of your that. brujo That's magic. <laughs> this is part of your brujo magic. You, you throw out like three predictions and then you get one right. No, I'm just teasing. That does it for this week's pod. Thank you guys again so much for listening. We will be back next week to review the New York City FC match. We will preview the midweek game against the Chicago Fire. And we'll probably have two episodes next week given that there's another busy slate. So, for Steve Brenner, I am Franco Penizo. This is Miami Total Football Radio. And we'll talk to you guys again very soon.